If you look at things like a Peloton or you talk to an average runner, they all know their heart rate zones. They all know this is what I'm going to do from a wattage standpoint today on the bike. And it's all evidence-based because it's been studied time and time again, and we just don't have that in climbing. And so I would venture to guess that for a recreational climber, it may be that almost 50% of their time is wasted not getting better. Hey y'all, I'm Ryan Devlin and welcome back to the Struggle Climbing Show where I talk with elite climbers about their struggles and breakthroughs in training, nutrition, tactics, and mental game, and also what they're passionate about beyond the fight with gravity. Now today's guest might not be a household name, at least not yet, but I think that's what makes this chat so dang valuable. Dr. Thomas Cunningham is a weekend warrior who climbs at an elite level. He's a board-certified emergency medicine physician who has published several papers, he holds multiple patents and is currently working as research faculty at the University of Louisville. He's also a husband and a father of three little kiddos. The guy is as busy as can be, but can he climb? Yeah, he can climb. He just sent the super classic Red River Gorge test piece, Southern Smoke, which is pretty much the pumpiest 14C sport route you can imagine, and he's working on the 9A direct start for that. He also has bouldered 8A, trad climbed 8A, and put up FAs up to, you guessed it, 8A, and he probably puts in less time at the gym or the crag than you do. Today he shares his scientific method as it pertains to training and nutrition and what he feels all of us, from beginners to pros, can do to optimize our time and level up in whatever our climbing goals are. Get psyched to get better. The official climbing nutrition sponsor of The Struggle is Fizzy Vantage. Not only do I use it every day, y'all, but so do Alex Magos and Natalia Grossman, Jonathan Segrist and Daniel Woods, and so many others, including today's guest, Dr. Thomas Cunningham. And I'm telling you, this guy knows a few things about research-based nutrition and supplementation, as you'll hear in today's chat. Y'all try their supercharged collagen to level up your connective tissue strength and health. I take it about an hour before climbing or loading my fingers, and they have never felt stronger or healthier. I also love Sendurex, which utilizes beetroot extract and other natural ingredients designed to boost endurance and promote fast recovery between attempts, which I've found super helpful when I'm training hard and I don't have a ton of time to rest between goes. I love all of their science-backed products, and I've been a paying customer long before I started this podcast. So give it a shot. I think you're going to see the difference just like I have. Hit that link in your show notes or use code STRUGGLE15 at checkout for 15% off at fizzyvantage.com. Well, the temps at the red have now hit smoldering and the humidity level just ticked up to dripping wet. So I am diving into a big time training block right now with a focus on strength. And first up whenever I do this is to test out my max hangs, my max pull-ups and a few other things. And my favorite way to do that is in the Crimped app, which is free, by the way. I've now got years of data in my Crimped profile, so I can see how I'm progressing, and I can use that data to optimize my training blocks. I friggin' love how well this app is laid out, y'all. They've got set it and forget it plans that are just fully programmed and ready to go to get you to peak performance in 12 weeks. They've got bouldering and sport plans, whichever your focus is. And then they've got the ability to customize and schedule your own workouts. Crimped is just hands down the best tool that I've ever used for programming my own training. Hit that link in your show notes or just search Crimped, C-R-I-M-P-D, in your app store to download it for free. I think you're going to love it. And lastly, a big thanks to all the patrons out there who are listening right now and who support me as I'm working really hard to bring you all these interviews as well as two videos each week on YouTube. So psyched for that. It's a ton of work, but I love it. And your all support makes it all possible. If you, dear listener, are gaining value from this show and you're in a position to contribute a few bucks a month as a patron, that would be so cool of you. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But first, is anyone here a doctor? I've always wanted to yell that. And we are in luck because we're about to get scientific with Dr. Thomas Cunningham. Thomas, it's great to have you on The Struggle. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm really psyched. Obviously, local guy. Always fun to do a local guy episode. Drew Mack has been on the show, and, and he and I went down this 
this fantastic rabbit hole of, of Red River Gorge Love Fest. I was actually out there a couple days ago. I was out at Undertow. Man, I was already feeling that humidity coming in, Thomas. I feel like you, you sent the proj right at the right time, dude. Yeah, I don't know if I'd be brave in the weather at this point. It's like what, 80 degrees, 80% humidity. Even on the Undertow when it's shady, that can be, that can be spicy. Yeah, right. we're driving out there. We're trying to stay optimistic. Like, no, no, it's still pretty good. And then, you know, you get like one bolt up on the route and that humidity hits you and that, the, you know, the, just the, the moisture in the air. And I was sliming off of AL8, but having fun time, having a fun time out there. And I'm still out project shopping, so it's okay. I don't have high expectations, but yeah, I feel like you kind of, your timing worked out really well. Was it April when you sent Southern Smoke? Mid-March, I think, uh, like, second week of March. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, the, the weather these days is a little weird, right? I mean, not really two distinct seasons, I feel like, anymore. We get, like, almost like the November into December, and then we get this, like, eight-week break. And then all of a sudden, like, starting at the end of February, it's starting to get, like, really good again. And then by mid-April, it's kind of over. It's like these two real, real quick seasons, so it makes it makes it difficult. Yeah, it's so true. Well, I'm excited to talk with you a little bit about that with, when it comes to kind of programming training because, yeah, it's really been compressed in this odd way where I got my best send conditions in the fall in December. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right around the corner and, like, you're getting great days in February. I'm like, that's, that's not a lot of time to eat cake and drink beer over Christmas before oh. I got to get back in shape. <laughs> you got you, you to keep that for the summer, right? For right now, now it's training season. That's right. Very good. Cool, man. Well, let's let's dive in here. I'm curious what struggle means to you through the lens of rock climbing. You you obviously have probably experienced quite a bit of struggle getting into and then being in the medical field. But as a climber and, and just specifically through that part of your life, what, what does struggle mean to you? What's your relationship with struggle? Yeah, so I, I think that it's a necessary evil in kind of the pursuit of finding balance, I think would be the best way to state it. You know, I, I think really if we're all kind of out there searching to find purpose or meaning or the flow or, you know, people call it different things, but I think that really that, that true purpose comes with true responsibility. And I think that responsibility is struggle, right? I mean, anything that you're really responsible for really is going to take a toll and it's gonna cause some struggle in your life, but that's really when you find the best purpose at that point. So for me, climbing embodies that in the physical space that, you know, it's an individual sport. It's, you know, you're very self-reliant. So when things go good or they go poorly, there's only one person really that you can fall back on. And so that's rewarding in some sense, but it's also difficult to deal with a failure in another. And, and that's a big struggle for me. Yeah, well, I appreciate you sharing that. And I think, you know, you've got a really unique perspective here that um, in a way straddles the listener experience as well as the guest experience, the typical pro athlete guest of the struggle here, in that you climb at an elite level, certainly at the level of the guests that I've had on the show, many of the guests here. Uh, but you also are a weekend warrior in that sense. You've got a full time job, you got a family, and you don't get outside a lot. That might be one of the biggest differences between yourself and, and other climbers that have joined me here on The Struggle. So let's, let's dive into the, the training chapter here um, with that kind of perspective, looking through that lens. But as always, let's start uh, where, we, where we tend to here, which is just struggle. And where is it that you do or have struggled with your training, Thomas? Yeah, I mean, I think number one would be finding time, you know, just having the, the work, the career, the businesses and family, finding time is probably the number one struggle. And then the second thing would probably be just figuring out the programming and figuring out how to be specific enough so that when I do get the time to go outside, it can be really, really utilized. Um, you know, I, I think that last year I got out you know, somewhere between 12 and 16 days the whole year. And I think I average maybe eight days a season. So I, I really try to pick the six, maybe six weeks that are going to be the peak time and try to get out, you know, once or twice a week. And so I really got to be ready from a, from a training perspective when that, the good weather hits. 
Yeah, it's so few days, and it, that's really distinctly counter to pretty much every conversation that I've had with every elite athlete on the struggle because their careers are climbing. And when your career is climbing, you're going to be spending a lot of time outdoors. Jonathan Segrest, you know, he'll put in maybe four days outside. Sometimes it'll be a half day to work on a project and then he'll go on the moon board or something like that. But, you know, highly values getting outside. Drew Mack, another one. I mean, you look at all the athletes, they're doing a, an incredible amount of, of time on rock and oftentimes on different kinds of rock and traveling and this kind of thing. And you talk to somebody like Tom Randall, who has been gathering climbing data for many, many years now. And I think he puts the figure somewhere around 40 or 50 days in a year where he sees a big jump between high performing climbers and those who are maybe hitting plateaus or just aren't kind of ascending through the grades where they want. And you're well below that, you know, 15, 16 days or something like that, 10 to 15 days in a season. And you obviously you're doing that out of necessity. It's not like you're just sitting around like, oh, I just won't climb today. It's it's you know, you have to pick and choose your days wisely. And I think that is something that a lot of listeners can can resonate with, myself included. So to your point, you have to make the training work. And one of your struggles, as you said, is even finding the time right for training. We're not even talking about taking a full day off to go to the crag. We're talking about maybe a few hours because you've got family, because you've got work. And the other struggle was the programming. And I think those are almost two sides of the same coin, right? If you're if you're programming wisely, then you should be able to find the time or, or vice versa. And tell me a little bit about that. If it, How have you been working through that struggle with regards to the programming and the scheduling of your training? I think actually early on coming back into climbing, I was doing too much volume and too much intensity, believe it or not. Um, both, yeah. both too much volume and too much uh, intensity. And I, I think it was because I would find these small segments of time. Maybe it's 30 minutes, maybe it's 45 minutes. And I have a, a you know, pretty decent setup in my garage where I have like a campus board with some medium rungs and some small rungs. I have some weights, squat rack, pull up bar, some hang boards, some micro holds. So I can get, you know, I can train a lot of different energy systems, but I was training, you know, five, six, sometimes seven days a week, just small volume. But because I, it was small volume, you know, I, I, the motivation was high. And so I would go down and it would just be really intense, really short, but I, was, I wasn't allowing myself enough time to recover. And, you know, from, from the days, you know, I, I think that I don't want people to be misled that, you know, I didn't at some point put in that volume, you know, like what you're talking about, Tom Randall talking about the, you know, the 40 or 50 days a year, you know, when I was, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, you know, that, that whole kind of high school in the college, you know, I went to the university of Kentucky, which is like 50 minutes door to the motherload parking lot. So I would, I would go down and listen to lectures in the car. I would stay at Miguel's and do homework. I mean, I was climbing outside four or five days a week for, you know, every day, summer, 80 degrees, 90 degrees. It didn't matter. Went to the undertow wall with the, the heat and we would just, you know, do laps. And so there was really no training early on in my career. It was purely climbing. I mean, I would, I had the Chris Sharma mantra, which was you know, training was getting on your project, right? I mean, it was just like limit bouldering on a rope, and then you would burn out the day on the easier, easier route. So, you know, I had that volume. And so I think when I came back into climbing, I just expected like, I'm just going to climb every day. And that's just kind of how it's going to work. And I quickly found out through some, some injury that that was, that was not the, not the case. Should not have done that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you a clarifying that you, you did have this season of life where you were putting in a ton of days because I think a clickable headline is, you know, busy dad climbs 14C and only climbs outside 15 days a year. And while that's true now, you did create a very substantial pyramid of experience on rock, moving over these kinds of routes, honing technique and, and crag tactics and that kind of thing to the point where now you've earned a place where you can be a little bit more specific with and and kind of reserved with how often you get outside. So I think that's that's important. That's a good thing for me to understand. It's a good thing for, for listeners to understand. But now here we are today and you are performing at 
a, a higher level than you ever were when you were, you know, in your mid 20s getting out to the crag every single day. And that it seems like is in large part because of how scientific and and specific and disciplined you've been able to get with your training. And so I'd love to hear what that looks like now. Sure. You know, when I kind of coming down off of the volume, I got really, really specific and I did much more of a linear periodization type of protocol. And I started just really deep diving and doing, you know, like a month or two of strength and then a month or two of power and then a month or two of power endurance. And then, you know, it would be kind of send season. I tried that for kind of like a whole six month block. And although I saw, you know, really good gains throughout the months, it was it was really hard for me to put that all together. And I saw during my performance phase, my power and my strength really dropped off pretty considerably. And so I think, you know, if you're looking at climbing from, you know, a performance realm, you really have to be ready when the weather is ready. You know, you can't just pick a day. I mean, unless you're a competition climber, which, you know, like, okay, it's March 15th and we got to be ready that day. But, you know, the season may come around and it may be early. It may be a little bit late. The days may or may not be working. And so I think that the more of a non-linear periodization is what I do now. And it's, it's a little bit of a blend where I will have kind of a focus system, but also be doing at least one day a week of the other system. So I'm not completely losing any one ability. So uh, you, we talked about how these seasons work at the Red River Gorge and really the peak time is kind of November into December. So, you know, for instance, last season, my kind of six week period was November one to kind of mid December was those six weeks where I really wanted to be prepared. So I started preparing say June or July and I would do two two days a week at least of strength and power where that entailed hangboarding, campus boarding a little bit, definitely some limit bouldering. And then one day a week I would dedicate to more of like a power endurance circuits, four by fours, tread wall, and then one day a week where it was just pure aerobic volume. And then I would, after a month or two or whenever I would start to see some plateauing or you know I would see that the gains were starting to slow down I would transition that into more of a, you know, power endurance phase. And so then I would back off the strength a little bit, do a little bit less moonboarding, a little bit less campus boarding, still, still pretty good, you know, two hard days a week of the hangboarding, but now I'm doing two days a week of power endurance work and maybe one day a week of the aerobic. And so I'll just kind of build that in. And I think that I've also learned that you can't be too scientific. You can't really put yourself in a box. And so, you know, there may be seasons where it takes you six or eight weeks to really kind of you still see growth, you know, in, in your hangboarding or your weight training or the campus scene. And then you kind of have to wait till it, it peaks up and then I'll start to transition to, to more of a power endurance, you know, starting in maybe August, September. And then by October, I'm putting everything together and doing, you know, a lot of aerobic still and then some power endurance as well. And then backing off of the strength and starting to taper that doing a lot less weight training, that kind of thing. From a kind of a 30,000 foot view here, if we're just comparing like linear periodized energy system training versus this non-linear, like you've kind of shifted towards, if I'm correct, on a linear one, you're going to you're going to have very distinctly defined phases. I'm in a strength phase, so I'm doing slow, you know, heavy loads, right? Like max hangs or weighted pull ups where it's just max effort. You're only doing a couple. You'll do yes. that for a month, six weeks, whatever kind of the block is in, until you start to see maybe some diminishing returns, some plateaus. Then you'll move very deliberately into a power endurance or kind of the the speed, the power phase where maybe you're just, it's lighter weight, you're doing snappier stuff. It might be moonboard or it might just be like, you know, fast pulls, campus boarding, that kind of thing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, talking about this nonlinear that you're doing, you're kind of mixing in a little bit of everything but you're, you have a focus. And so if you're in the strength phase, like you were saying, it's a couple days a week of b developing the strength where maybe it's one day a week of endurance and one day a week of power endurance. And then you shift into the power endurance and that weighted average kind of switches. And now you're doing maybe a couple days of power endurance and only one day of strength. A, am I understanding that correctly? 
Yeah, you're understanding it, Ed, perfectly. It's always, you know, mobility before strength, strength before power, power before power endurance. And so I think that if if you use that as kind of your your overall 30,000 foot view, it a straight linear program works really well for a beginner because it allows them to really focus their energy on each different system. But I think as you progress, the gains that you will get out of a pure linear program start to plateau. They, you know, have this kind of negative regression. And so at that point, I think if you're seasoned, moving to a nonlinear program allows a little bit more flexibility and a little more integration so that when the send time or the kind of project season comes, there is less of a dip from your power and power endurance. I think the beauty of sport climbing and what really excites me about the training and the programming is that you can't just be powerful. You can't just be strong. You can't just have tons of endurance. You have to find this perfect time where it all kind of comes to a head. And so you have to figure out when you're peaking on that strength and power. And then you also have to be okay with knowing that wherever your peak is, it's going to come down a little bit as you're training up your endurance. And so as those two paths cross, you have this golden window where everything comes together and it's just, it's, it's so fun to get there. I mean, like I, when I get to that point where I start to hit those kind of benchmarks on the tread wall or on the, you know, hang board or those kind of things. And I kind of see like, okay, it's, it's, you know, trust the system, trust the system. It's, it's really fun to, to kind of go through that process. Yeah, for sure. And, and so that does make a lot of sense from a practical point of view. I mean, maybe from a purely scientific point of view, the true linear periodization might be the best way to kind of individually optimize each system. But in practice, it's not about that as much as it is trying to your point, get, get this like Venn diagram where they all, everything overlaps perfectly in this little window so that while everything maybe isn't at the pure optimization, they're all like close enough where that's going to create these perfect conditions to for for peak performance because you're going to need a little bit of everything. We're talking about sport climbing here, you know, you and I are because that's predominantly what we focus on. It may be a little bit different, I guess, if you're a boulder or maybe it's more focused on pure power or pure strength and, and less so much about, you know, endurance, I would suppose. Yeah, and I think I think as you get towards the upper end of the athletes in our sport, I think that it's you know, it behooves them to have an even more nonlinear focus. You know, if you're Alex Magos, your ability to train and withstand volume would allow you to probably do two days a week of every single energy system and still have enough recovery power to excel and to build gains in each system. But I don't know if, I mean, I don't think I am there. I think that the times where I have just done, you know, all the systems every week, no focus, trying to like improve all of them at the same time, it it goes a little bit too slowly and I can't optimize things. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and so this kind of ties back into something that you just mentioned, which is really trying to understand where you're at at any given point of time. And how, how do you do that? Sure, I, I keep a really detailed log you know, with all of my workouts. And so I'll, I will have a reference to that from the prior season or two or three or four. And so, you know, as I'm going through, say, my strength phase, I know where my peak was the season prior in, you know, metrics like my two rep max on bench press, deadlift, uh, reverse curl, weighted pull-ups, you know, where I was on the campus board, how much weight could I add to do 147? Was I doing 158, 158 and a half? You know, where was that in my training block? And how many days or how many sessions did it take for me to get there? And so, you know, I have found for myself, for instance, after about six to eight sessions on a given exercise, I am close to peaked out and anything else is going to give me you know, the same response or just dig a little bit of a recovery hole or increase me at injury. But I generally will do about four weeks on and then one deload week where I will do half the volume 
but at a similar intensity. So half the reps or half the time or half the hangs or something like that. I love it, man. That's great. It's great to, you know, again, you, you're you're climbing at a, a level that I, I won't ever, but, and, and to be frank, you're far more detail oriented and scientific about your training to, to a level that I probably never will either. But there's a lot to be gleaned from that because the more we know about ourself, whether we're climbing 510 or 514, the more we can check in, the, the more specific we can get with our training, the less time we're wasting, essentially, because you just know when to move on to the next thing or you know when to peak and get outside and try the project. And mm-hmm. I think that's, you know, that's a huge advantage for somebody who doesn't have the luxury of just being able to pop out onto the proj whenever the heck they want. If you've got a pretty narrow window where you need to be at peak performance, you want to know with some confidence when you're at peak performance. And maybe my last question here on this chapter before we move on to nutrition is what happens when you're checking in on that stuff and you're and you're off, you know, like you're just not you're not where you want to be. I can think of three instances where this has happened. And the first two times I doubled down and tried to push harder. And both those times I ruptured an A4 pulley. Oh, And the third time that it happened, I took a deload week, adjusted my schedule, delayed the season, which was last fall, and just said, okay, it's not there yet. I need rest. The training's been, you know, cumulative. I took about, I don't know, maybe five or six days, climbed like one day in the middle there, did some really quick stuff, and then came back. The first week back, I kind of felt pretty poor. And then the following week, it was like the light switch just went on and everything was there. Plus some, it was like everything was coming together. It was, but the season was, we only had like, I think I got two or three more days outside and it was like, man, it's feeling really good. And so I, I definitely had to sacrifice time and days that I would have probably had outside resting instead of kind of chasing the weather and like sitting there and like watching my friends and climbing partners go outside when it's primo knowing that like if i go out right now either i'm gonna hurt myself or i'm gonna it's just it's not worth it i'm not my body isn't ready it needs recovery before it gets back out and so i had to kind of think to myself okay do i do i kind of do what i've done already two times or do i just take a little rest and then maybe this season is just not the season and so that was i mean especially like at our age where you don't really have an unlimited amount of seasons left. That was really a hard decision. And so I viewed it in the lens of, okay, I'm, you know, this season, it it, maybe it's not going to go, but I'm going to be really fresh. I'm not going to be overtrained. And then I can try to double down in the winter and then come back. And I I mean, that, that was definitely the right choice. Hell yeah. The power of rest. Climbers never want to rest, but sometimes the answer, maybe more times than not, the answer is a little bit of rest. How do you look at that? This will be my last question in this chapter because we got to get on to nutrition. But when it comes to rest, you said maybe it was a deload week every fourth week, I believe, or maybe I'm misremembering that. But but yeah, just how do you look four. at rest in general? And then also let's, let's wrap sleep into that I- as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we can cover both of that. I'm definitely a very aggressive personality when it comes to training and so I'm, I'm like 110 or zero I'm not going to give it 80 percent so rest is is really really hard for me and so I think I need a metric to tell me when I need that and so you know I wear I wear a whoop I've been wearing it uh, you know the last I think I'm like 400 recoveries so maybe like just just over a year mm-hmm. I've been wearing that and before that it was really hard for me to even think that I needed the rest because my brain would just tell me you're not, you're failing, you're struggling, you need to double down, like, you know, keep going. And so now for me to have something that is objectively telling me, no, you are, you are overtrained, you are fatigued, you need to rest. And then being able to see what that does for my body where all of, you know, resting heart rate, HRV, sleep quality, all of that after a little bit of a deload just like shoots up has been really, really advantageous. It's also allowed me to really tailor in things like sleep in my recovery, you know, supplements and nutrition and diet and all of those things that you can kind of help track with with things like the Whoop or, or some of the other wearables. And so 
you know, sleep is definitely king. Um, I think before having something that measured my sleep, I was definitely not getting enough. You know, I was someone that was thinking, yeah, if I'm in, in my bed for seven or eight hours, I'm getting seven or eight hours. But, you know, for me, I'm about a 93 to 95% efficiency sleeper. And so I, if I want eight hours, I need to be in bed for nine. You know, so I'm getting probably comparative to like maybe two years ago, I'm probably getting an hour more of sleep a night on average than I was, which is, I mean, you look at the studies and I mean, it's, it's linear. The amount of power and strength after a six to seven hour night versus an eight to nine hour night, it's like almost 25 to 30% difference in, you know, multiple studies that they look at. So, I mean, it is a huge jump just with sleep. So, I mean, I think the general rule is that you probably need to be in bed an hour more than what you, than what you think. So if you, if you need eight, and I would say most people need eight, you know, I'm not saying everyone, so there, there may be those mutants out there that can get it along with, you know, four hours like Benjamin Franklin, but I think for the most part, if you need eight, you should probably be in bed for nine hours. Yeah, man. Well, I love that we're talking about this for a second here because it's certainly something that impacted me in a significant way. And I I think as we get older, and I, I spoke with Tom Randall about this recently too, where he works with clients and it's around kind of when you hit 30 and somewhere in that range where your responsibilities, your life, you'd start to take on a much more significant allostatic load, as, as he says. So so the, the stressors on your system that go beyond exercising or just climbing, and there's a real impact of that on performance, right? And we, we not only have to take that into account when we're programming our training or our climbing, but also our sleep. And there's something that seems distinctly American, in a sense, about like a badge of honor for not getting enough sleep. And so that statistic there where you told, you know, 20 to 30% more power when you're getting that optimal sleep, that is no joke. Yeah, I think that they did. They did uh, like vertical jump. They did squats and leg raises, I think were the, the big, big metrics that they used. But I mean, they would, they would chronically sleep deprive one group, give them you know, and, and not even that, I mean, just like six to seven was one group and the other group was eight to nine. So there's, you know, maybe a two hour difference that's there. And it was, I mean, huge difference, not just like 5%, not just like 10. I mean, there's no supplement that you can take that is going to give you a 10 to 20% edge. There's not, it just, I mean, sleep is the best supplement for sure. All right, let's set our sights on nutrition now. Thomas, you're a medical doctor. I think you probably have a lot to say about this. We also, um, I think we should touch on supplements because we touched on that just a bit at the end of the training chapter there. But first, let's hear from you personally on where you've struggled with your nutrition or where you may continue to struggle with your nutrition. So I would say I've made a big, a big shift kind of one direction and then kind of coming back. And that is really with carbohydrates and like fueling for climbing. I mean, there's so much literature for or against any single dietary option that it's really hard to figure out what it is that you need to optimize your nutrition, especially for a sport where the literature is, you know, pretty minimal. And so I definitely was consuming lots of carbohydrates, not really watching my diet, not doing much at the beginning. And then kind of transitioned more into, you know, I would say intermittent fasting, one meal a day, keto, in an effort to really try to help with metabolic flexibility. And in doing so, you know, I saw personally a decrease in power, a decrease in strength. My testosterone levels went down and I'm, I'm kind of more in the middle where um, I think that you have to do a little bit of both. And so, you know, I've, I've you know, looked at things like blood work and the supplementation and continuous glucose monitoring, all of those kind of in an effort to hone the nutrition to get it as optimal as I can. Yeah, well, let's let's peel back on some of this then. First and foremost, when you're talking about you were kind of more mindlessly and I guess at least not with a specific amount of direction consuming a lot of carbs, what were those in the form of? And let me preface this with, I, I love carbs so much. So let's just spend some time talking about donuts because I just love donuts so much. But what is too many carbs for Thomas? And, or, or is it the timing of the carbs? Or is it the type of the carbs? You know, there's obviously a difference between, I guess, kind of 
sugar and, um, and pasta and these kinds of things. So not my area of expertise, but you seem to have done quite a bit of a dive into it. So we'd like to learn a little bit more about kind of what wasn't working or what required optimization. And then let's talk about how you got there. I think uh, the short answer is it depends. You know, I've had lots of different athletes wear continuous glucose monitoring, you know, all the way from 20 year olds up to 40 year olds, myself, you know, a lot of my climbing partners. And so everybody is a little bit different and everybody's going to respond to certain carbohydrates differently. And so what you really want to do is you want to try to decrease the amount of insulin response and the amount of highs and lows in your glucose curve. So, you know, if I ingest a carbohydrate, I'm going to start to digest that. Our body's going to break it down. It's going to turn it into glucose, the main substrate that we use for fuel. And then our body is going to use insulin to take that glucose and move it into the cells so they can use it for energy. That's kind of the, the overall viewpoint. But for instance, I love oatmeal. I, I have always eaten oatmeal for like my entire life. And, you know, I wore a continuous glucose monitor and quickly realized that when I eat that oatmeal and I put a little bit of brown sugar and some fruit on there that, oh my goodness, my glucose spikes to like 160, which is really high for a non-diabetic. And then my body, you know, re responds to that appropriately. And, and all of a sudden I get this really sharp drop all the way back down and I become a little bit hypoglycemic and anecdotally, I would feel that when I would go out climbing, I would have, you know, my, my oats and my brown sugar and my blueberries and raspberries or banana. And I would be eating that in the car on the way down. And then all of a sudden I would get there and I would get out of the car and I would be like, man, I'm just like, I feel sluggish. And it would, you know, I'd have to start to eat on the way up to the crag or I'd have to have, you know, a Gatorade or a cliff bar or something like that. And my, I was playing like this big glucose wave pool where my glucose levels were just like going up and down, up and down, up and down the whole day and, and nothing was really stable. And it was hard to find a time where, you know, I would, I would feel good. You Is know, it just, there, to, to, sorry to interject, but so I understand kind of even the most basic part of the science here. Is the idea to have a more flat glucose kind of level throughout the day, or is it to have like a big spike right when you want to go try something really hard? Or is that not good because you, you'll get like a crash in the middle of it? I'm not quite sure how long you, those waves last, for example. Yeah, so you, you don't, you want to have a as small of a niter as you can. So the the delta between your average glucose the tighter you can regulate that the better but you also have a kind of this goldilocks zone where you're going to feel optimal to perform and there's several studies that look at performance and glucose level and it's pretty linear and so people will perform better at higher levels of glucose to a point and typically most people will non-diabetics are going to end diabetics alike are going to perform pretty well in the 110 to 130s range and so you want to be in that zone but you don't want to be popping into that zone and then coming back down i mean it can be very abrupt i mean it may be 15 or 20 minutes where you're up and then down and so if you're getting on route too early or too late in that all of a sudden your fuel stores are going to be poor the other thing is that when you spike like that and you go really high, the body is going to secrete a whole lot of insulin, which is adversely going to affect your energy level, your fatty oxidation. Insulin has a very negative effect on performance in the short term. Now, you want the insulin response for muscle growth after when you slam the protein and you eat the big carbohydrate meal after you're done. But, you know, you don't want to feel like you feel after you eat the meal while you're trying to send your project. So the tighter you can get that, the better. And everybody's going to respond differently to foods. You know, I've had people that eat apples and they have just a really terrible reaction to apples, but then they eat a banana and they do really well. And so figuring out that time frame and figuring out how your body reacts to it and allows you to figure out when that, that sweet spot is going to be there. And it sounds like there's a very clear and established way to learn that. And that's wearing a continuous glucose monitor which I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience with that, but also to probably the vast majority of the people that are going to be tuning into this, they may not have that ability. Either they can't get it prescribed or there are kind of over-the-counter type boutique options that you can have, but they're quite expensive, at least from, you know, from what I know. And so maybe they're just 
not that serious, but they'd still like to have some sort of sense about what their diet or their scheduling of when they're fueling impacts kind of these optimization windows of either exercising or performing. And so maybe you could speak to what like the CGM is and, and, and a little bit about how it can give you that information. But for those who maybe don't have access to that or can't afford access to it, are there other ways that we can try to get some sort of maybe not as exact, but some sort of guardrails for improving that aspect of, of our, our diet and our training? I think I'll, I'll take the second second part first. I think that's a, a good point. I think that, you know, you, you kind of know how you feel. And I think you, your subjective feeling is, is as important. I mean, even when we're looking at athletes, blood sugar on the CGM, we're asking them questions of, you know, how did you feel? Right. And so if you're keeping a food log and you know that when you eat this food, you feel poorly, I mean, you need to write that down either in your back of your brain or in your phone or make a note or in your training log, because you don't, you want to make sure that you get that down. Now, I think one of the things is just to make sure that at each of your meals, you have an appropriate amount of macros. And so one of the things that I did with say the oatmeal is that that was a pretty pure carbohydrate meal. I mean, I had fruit, it had fiber, but you know, there really wasn't any fat or protein with that. And so adding things like protein and fat to a carbohydrate meal are going to slow down the digestion process. And so what I started to do is I would uh, take some of my oats and I would add two eggs, maybe some pumpkin and some yogurt, and I would blend it all up and I would make these little oatmeal pancakes. And so there was some yogurt, there was some egg, there was a little bit of fat that was in there. There was also the carbohydrates. And so taking that as more of like a complete meal instead of just pure carbohydrates, my glucose curve was much more flat looking at that. I mean, and that's not really new science. I mean, if you talk to a registered dietitian, they're going to give you that kind of advice like, oh, you felt poorly probably because you just slammed blueberries, raspberries, brown sugar, and oatmeal. I mean, that's, right. it doesn't take a continuous glucose monitor to figure that out. So I think being smart about your fueling and the general consensus is maybe about three hours before you're going to do some type of exercise performance bout is a good rule of thumb. And then I will usually, you know, so if I'm eating at 9 a.m., 8.30, 9 a.m. for I'm going to start my project goes at noon or 12.30, I'll have that meal then. And then maybe 45 minutes before have some type of snack like a banana or a Gatorade. And most of those are going to be within about 30 minutes to an hour as a general rule of thumb. Yeah, that's a great general rule. And at least for us who are commuting from Louisville to the Red, it's, you know, two to three hours to drive out and, and hike in. So having the meal before we leave our house allows that to settle. And then we have that snack when we get to the crag. Others can time it out accordingly, whether it's a gym session or um, you're heading outside. Um, but what about CGM then, uh, continuous glucose monitoring? How do you, how does one use that to really just kind of take nutrition knowledge to the next level? If you wanted to get more nuanced using the CGM, then you could really tailor it in. You know, we we had an athlete that really was into potatoes and he loved to do these breakfast skillets where he would do like eggs and sausage and potatoes. And we found out pretty quickly that when he would use normal potatoes, he was way high, like way off the chart. And we, we experimented and used sweet potatoes and it was it was so much better. Hmm. Those are some things where, you know, maybe you could anecdotally feel that effect, but that's really where the CGM shines is that you can do these little dietary experiments and figure out, okay, if I just make this one little change, I do a, lo a whole lot better. And then, you know, for like the pre pre send meal, you know, he was using apples and really going really high. And it's something that he had been doing his whole life and it kind of felt low energy levels, but hadn't put the two and two together. And then we kind of switched him over to, you know, more of an electrolyte beverage and some bananas or some, some Gatorade. And it had a little bit of a better effect there for him too. So that's, I think those are the nuanced things that you can use the, the CGM for, and then really kind of tailor in the time to figure out, is it, is it 30 minutes? Is it 45 minutes? Is it an hour? When am I going to be in that? And you know, you have it on your arm, you can scan it to your phone so you can scan it and be like, okay, I'm 115. Like it's go time. I really want to get one of these Thomas and I want to try to break it. 
like I want to go on one of my donut beer bending weekends and I, like I just want to I want to see what happens it's crazy so for me uh ice cream all day long not a big jump no kidding uh, yeah and I think it's I think it's the lucky um, you my body does really well when I when I merge the the protein and the carbs and the fat together so it's it's so individualistic it depends on your gut microbiome it depends on you know your genetics and your you know single nucleotide polymorphisms and how you respond to all these foods it's i mean it's really nuanced and so you just don't know until you know oh man we are just like scratching the surface here on this nutrition chapter looking at it through the scientific medical doctor lens that you bring to it i think cgm's super interesting but even as you touched on a little bit earlier just all of us paying attention keeping a log what um are the effects what's the efficacy of certain foods when we go out and we train or we perform so love all of this i think um i i taste a follow-up episode in the making here and of course everybody can pop by your website to learn more about cgm and everything else that you're working on but um i think it's it's probably a good opportunity for us now to um shift gears to the tactics chapter all right, my man, tactics, let's dive in. Maybe looking at it through the lens of Southern Smoke, 14C, super classic route, crazy, crazy hard rock climbing. And uh, as we've already discussed, you didn't have a ton of days on it. So it seems like a good place for us to to jump into tactics. But first, let's talk about struggle and, and where have you struggled with your tactics? Uh, I would say uh, tactically, it's that that route goes into the shade in the afternoon and I like to be home for dinner. So I think <laughs> that, was, that was a big tactical challenge, just figuring out when the conditions would be good. It's a pretty narrow the window then, right? If you're, not, yeah. if you're not willing to climb until 7 p.m., that, that really narrows the amount of attempts that you're going to get. If you're spending an entire day, you're giving up a day of your life and you only have a handful of them each season to go out to the red, to hike back to Bob, to, to get set up and warmed up, all of these things, right, that go into... What do you, you only get maybe a couple good goes in a day? Yeah, I think two goes would be what, what I would do. And I think, you know, if I had more time, I probably could have put in a third go. I don't know how productive it would have been early on just because the route's so long and so overhung and physical that it would be hard to be productive. You know, that tactically speaking, that was, that was one big struggle was just figuring out timing. And I think that that's something that everybody has to look at on their project is to know when is it good in the season? When is it in the shade? And vice versa, I think that because it got sun early, I was able to project it a little later in the season because if it was really cold, you would get there and it would be in the sun. But then right when it went into the shade, it was almost too cold. And so I, I kind of had to change, you know, whereas if you were only doing shade send goes, the season is earlier versus if there's a, you want to be able to get on it right when it goes in the shade, then you need it to be a little bit colder. So I had to adjust that. How long, just so we, we can understand here on, because we're looking at this through the lens of Southern Smoke, when did you start projecting that in earnest? So I would say it would be last spring. So one, one year ago, I had got on it a little bit in the fall of 21, just kind of as like a project shopping thing. But then right. I think set my mind to it, like, okay, I'm, this, I'm going here every day. That was the spring of last year. And I think maybe, I think I was out like seven, six or seven days in the spring. And then I think the same, like maybe eight days and then another like seven or seven days, I think. So I think it was like 25 days total and every trip out to the red was to to get on that route you weren't going out and and clipping chains on anything else building a pyramid quote unquote you know topping out having a fun day literally every time you headed out to the red river gorge it was with one objective in mind i climbed three routes that was it warm-ups yeah so i would i would go and we would do two laps on betaville pipeline and then i would do ultra perm and then I would rest, and then I would do two burns on Southern Smoke, and then we would drive. And so Betaville's a 12A, Ultra Perm mm -hmm. is... 13D. 13D. Two laps on Betaville, so two laps on a 12A, one lap on 13D, and then two goes, two working yeah. goes on the project. You know, because I wanted to make sure the... I wanted to make sure the warm-up was exactly the same, 
so that I knew exactly how I was feeling and there was not going to be any like chance of injury or, you know, doing something dumb or trying to flash or onsite some random route or something like that. I was coming off of a, a pulley injury last spring. And so I knew that that like that whole first spring season was was really more about like getting the beta and getting healthy and putting in some some burns on it, knowing that like it's it's really not going to be anything serious until the fall so i, I kind of had that mindset going into that season but i would do you know i would i would go to the crag and i would probably spend 45 minutes to an hour just hangboarding and doing mobility and kind of warming up the fingers and and everything before you got on the route the warm-up routes you would do yeah. a hangboard warm-up talk me through that just you know some mobility hangboard like what do you sure. do and how long is it taking yeah so i mean a little bit of a jog up to the crag maybe five or 10 minutes of cardio. And then I would do like some scapular pulls. I would do some, you know, shoulder rotations, wrist rotations. I would do some stretching, some hip mobility, knee mobility, ankle mobility, kind of going in a, a circuit doing, you know, some pull-ups and some scap retractions and that kind of thing first. And then I would do like some finger curls with my feet on the ground, just to kind of really warm up all the tendons and ligaments. And I would do like some push-ups um, at that point and do like some wide grip, narrow grip, just to try to help with the triceps and the chest area to help get that warm. And then I would do three sets of seven on, three seconds off times six repeaters. And I would go through and do like one full set of each grip type. So I would do like four finger open hand and then half crimp and then a three finger drag. There's a lot of three finger drag holds on that route. So I wanted to make sure I had that grip pretty well warm. Sure. At that point, I would do like some pull ups and some power pull ups to try to get like the heart rate going. So I would do kind of like a quasi muscle up on the flashboard. And that, that's really what I would use to warm up would be the flashboard to get the fingers warm. And then I would do I would do those two twelves, two twelve warm ups just to get some blood flowing and see how the rock fell and get this, you know, how's the skin doing. And then I would do another little hangboard session and I would do uh, some one arm pull ups and some like one arm hangs. And it would just be like one hang for like five seconds on each grip type. So I would do like one five second hang on a four finger open hand, one on a half crimp and one on a three finger drag. And I would do like a couple of one arm pull ups to kind of like get the power really going. Sure. And then, you know, hydrate. And then I would do ultra perm, which is. It's probably like 11 plus to a no hands rest. And then you get like two bolts of 12 minus to where it meets up with Southern smoke. And then you get to do like the whole like last third of Southern smoke on ultra perm. So yeah. that was, that was like really like tactically, that was extremely helpful because it allowed me to like brush the holds if I needed to. Like if I got up to the mid part of ultra perm, I was like, I'm getting a little flash bump, but I just take brush the holds. If I was having a good day, you know, maybe take it all the way to the top. But tactically, that was nice to be able to really dial in the end of the route before I even got on it during the day. Well, you know, I'm really glad that we spent some time here just talking about the warm up because we don't typically, you know, tactics. This chapter is is pretty wide reaching, and every athlete brings their own their own special uh, struggles and and also their their kind of skill set to the tactics chapter here. Um, the warm up hasn't been one that we spent a lot of time on, and I think it's definitely one that gets skipped over by I think a lot of weekend warriors. Certainly myself, right? So most recently when I was out um, at the load, we were going to go warm up on some kind of like high tens, but got distracted, hopped on this 11B that my buddy and I hadn't been on, it ended up being like heinous, terrible, and like full flash pump because it was all cruxy and weird to read. And I was trying hard because I wanted to try to flash it and then ended up like blowing. I don't know if the whole day was blown, but maybe the first part of the day. So just, you know, sometimes you can get out there and you're like a kid in a candy store and that, that can be fun and, and fine too. But when we're talking about limit projects like you were just talking about, having that consistent warm up to check in with the body to know that you're um, fully primed to try hard, that takes the guesswork out of it. And I really appreciate you sharing that. We can all have our version of that. Like I'm not gonna be doing one arms like you are, but I could have my own flashboard routine, my own um, kind of laps that I'm running before I get on that limit project, which I do need to develop 
before I try that 13A this fall. So really good stuff for us to be thinking on. Now let's talk about the route. And when you only have a handful of times to actually get out on the route, I'm curious tactically what that means with regard to um, your training and, and just even understanding kind of the moves that you're going to need to do. In, in preparation, I would set mimics and uh, simulators on the tread wall that were, you know, the holds would be similar in size and character and grip type and, you know, similar number of moves and that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, early on, I took video of the route. I think I can still remember, but it was like 17 moves in a minute and 47 seconds in the first section to the first good rest. And then after that, it was 27 moves with in the middle one shake for each arm. And that took about two minutes and seven seconds. And then I had like the main rest. And then after that, it was 25 moves that took me about a minute and 20 seconds to do that. And so I would set on the tread wall, like that many moves, similar rest, this many moves, similar rest, this many moves. And so, you know, going into the season, you can really get the tread wall to the right angle and right at the right speed and you can stop it and you can rest. And so you can build a simulator that is essentially the same fitness that you would need for the route. And so I would, you know, do lots of volume on that. So I, I would really know exactly how my body was feeling before I would even do the first day of the project. Yeah, man, using the tread wall like that is, it's like a novel idea, at least to me. I, I've used the tread wall. Uh, you and I go to the same gym, gyms, actually, two gyms here in Louisville, and one of them has the tread wall. And I've used it as like a warm up or to do some um, kind of longer endurance type training, but I've never used it to set a simulator. I've set boulder simulators like on my little spray wall in my basement or, or just found them on, on route at the gym. But to use the treadwall like that's really interesting. Um, and especially because you're keeping track of the number of moves, right? So you can set the angle, like you said, you can do the number of moves on similar holds and take a rest. I'm assuming you kind of like trigger the little laser there. You hit the stop button, you take a rest for as long as your rest would be, and then you start it back up and you keep going. And in that way, you can simulate um, you could simulate a 50 foot route or a hundred foot route and really hit that energy system down to the rests, which is really fascinating to me. And that sounds like a, a heck of a way to train if you cannot get out on the route a lot, which of course, in, in your case, you can't. One of the, I think one of the things that happens in sport climbing is, you know, I, and I would love to figure out how to do this study, but you know, you get better at your project through the season even though your fitness is declining, mm -hmm. right? So when you get to performance season, like day one or the first third, you are probably the most fit you're going to be. And yet right. after seven or eight or nine or 10 days on your project, you're getting better and better and better. And that's not because you're more fit. It's because you're more efficient. Your muscle memory is better. Your resting positions are better the muscles that you're using on that route that you have a hard time training are now more accustomed to those positions. So if we talk like, you know, Southern smoke, the first rest has a really high, like left heel hook. It's really awkward. And so if you can set a rest position that is similar to that with, you know, three finger drag and four finger open hand this far apart and with your heel way up on the side, you can mitigate the time that it's going to take to become efficient in that rest. In the same way, at the second rest, your feet are way over to the right. You have this really bad right knee scum that just blows your calf out of the water. And you ha I have to stay there for like two minutes is what I figured out. Like every any time I left there before two minutes, I couldn't make it through the last crux. So I would purposefully get to that rest on the treadwall at Rocksport and I would I would watch the timer and I would just I mean it was like calf fatigue but if my calf was not the limiting factor and I could make the limiting factor my arms I knew I could stay there much much longer and so you know these rest positions are are as important and as vital as the rest of your fitness and so you know getting comfortable 
in the training phase or in that power endurance phase as the buildup to the, the season probably saves you and maybe a week's worth of project time because you're already efficient in those rest positions, whether it's a knee bar or a heel hook or a weird grip or the, you know, the feet are way out left or way out right. you know, you know, so a lot of times like you'll get, get down from the project and you're like, man, my, like my obliques are killing me. Like, why is that? And it's like, Oh, this is because I was upside down with my legs way over to the side. And, you know, I'm not used to doing that. Like I don't practice that position on the moon board. Right. So I think if you can get those little nuanced areas in and, and set something that's similar, I think that that really helps. All right, let's talk about mental game here. And I love this chapter. I'm always interested to hear where elite athletes struggle with their mindset, with their mental game. What, what is that for you, Thomas? Yeah, I would say mine is definitely fear of failure. And I think that that's pretty prolific through most of the areas in my life. And so I think that like selecting projects that are, you know, really difficult and where failure is a real threat allows me to see where the limits of, of my potential are. Oftentimes when we're met with discomfort or a fear, we do all that we can to avoid it. But you're aware that you've got this fear of failure and you're driven to almost push yourself to that point or to that limit in order to what to grow to 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 overcome it to feel like it's not as fun or rewarding if if the outcome is somewhat given where, where do you think that that drive comes from yeah I, I think that it is it's a it's a space that i feel safe to maybe exploit that fear mm. uh, and i think that especially early in life having climbing as a space where I did fail and had to learn with the failure with that. I think that that allowed me to maybe grow and choose some more difficult, you know, aspirations. Otherwise, I, you know, I think that, you know, if I was in, you know, had a passion or a sport that I was involved with that maybe didn't have those challenges that maybe I wouldn't have had the personal growth to pursue things like medicine or, you know, a family or career or, or those kind of things. And so I think that one of the big things that climbing has helped me with mentally is to deal to deal with that failure because you, I mean, you have to confront that head on like 99% of the time, right? Like most of the time, if you're getting out there and truly projecting, you know, there's, it's every day is failure. Like you're going out and you're getting on the project knowing, oh my goodness, like I'm, you know, it's probably not happening today, maybe tomorrow. And, and when you are faced with those significant setbacks, you mentioned some injuries that you've had to contend with or your schedule changes, something comes up at home, a kid is sick, these kinds of things that, you know, there's always a monkey wrench that are, that are thrown into the best laid plans, especially for people who are professionals, parents have a lot going on beyond just uh, their own pursuits in climbing. What, what tools do you use to not get discouraged when there are those setbacks? Yeah, I would say the, fir the first time I got injured with a pulley injury, I, I mean, I was I was definitely set back. There's definitely some, you know, some depression and some some difficulty and definitely some inner growth and some learning that I had to, to do, you know. And I think that at that point, I realized like how important having that outlet was because now that outlet was gone. And so, you know, I, I definitely remember it was kind of like over. Christmas holiday break, I was dealing with a pulley injury. I, I could do, you know, some body weight pull-ups. I could do some finger curls. That was about it. And I was really able to kind of turn my focus from climbing just from a time standpoint and really dive into more of family and just that kind of community. And having that there almost allowed me to be like, wow, you know, like it, it is just climbing. And we have this whole other responsibility and struggle and purpose. And I think that having both of those things has allowed me to, to grow in both areas for sure. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Let's, let's look at it now kind of specifically on your red point days. And that's typically when, at least for me and, and some of the athletes that I've talked to, Alex Magos comes to mind, and, and I think it was documented quite well in that Rot Punked video that he did with Ken Etzel, where a fear of failure 
And typically the two big fears that, that people share here on the struggle are a fear of falling and a fear of failure. Those are kind of the two main fear buckets that exist in the climbing world. And and for elite performing athletes like yourself, it's far more common to have a fear of failure because typically by this point in time, we've dealt with a fear of falling unless we've just recently had some sort of accident or, or injury or, or something around that. So that's fairly common, but it's not exclusive to elite athletes. When I go out and I'm, you know, climbing the 512s, but when I was climbing in the 510s even, you go out and you're around friends or there's other people at the crag because it's a busy day and you get on a route and you start thinking to yourself, oh, I hope I don't mess this up or I hope I don't look like a fool falling here. I really just want to send this because I told my buddies I was going to send it. All these things that probably nobody else gives a shit about, but we, we, we write these, these things in our heads, right, that, that builds up an expectation of success. And that's where the fear of failure, I think, ultimately starts to, to manifest and, and weasel in. And when you've only got a couple goes and you're out on your project, how do you prepare yourself mentally or with your setting or with the group of people you're with or, or anything that you, that, that you found to help put that fear of failure aside? I'm sure it's motivating in some sense, but you know, how do you manage that to either benefit your performance or at least not impede your performance on a day where you're really going to try to make an effort to do the thing? Yeah, I mean, I think the fear of failure, having that fear also breeds a really, really strong self-motivation. And so I think, you know, echoing your point, you know, a lot of the high performers having that fear of failure, you know, I think that that it's, it's that inner monologue that because of that fear, the way that we have to cope with that is that we have, we have two options, right? We can succumb to that fear and then choose not to perform at our best because if we do perform at our best and we fail, then that's the biggest blow. It's mm -hmm. that it's that, okay, we're not worthy. We're not good enough in our own eyes. But if we can take that healthy fear of failure and channel that into more of a self-motivation confidence flow, I think that that is, you know, that is one of the strongest indicators of someone that will perform. And so I have to look at it through a lens of you have to leave everything out there. And I have to be okay with the failure if I can truly say that I gave it everything. And I definitely ran into that on a mental standpoint where I started to not necessarily accept the failure, but want it to feel a little easier and, you know, kind of get into the flow. And so my climbing partner uh, at the time, Sam Elias, he pretty much took me aside and he was like, man, you are not trying. Like, I know what you look like when you try and you are not giving it a hundred percent. Like, this is not an easy route. It's a hard route. Treat it like a hard route and you, you got to give it everything. And so that was like the last kick in the pants that I needed to, to just like remind myself, like, look, it's, it's not about the failure. It's about the process and you got to try really hard. It's going to be really hard. Hell yeah. How do you summon that try hard? Is there, are there things that you do? You seem to be a man of routine and, and very thought out processes when it comes mm -hmm. to that five minutes or whatever it is, that pregame ritual before you pull on to the route to try the thing, to try hard. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Visualization is a big thing. I think breathing is a big thing, knowing how and when to use your breath to kind of amp up the cardiovascular system, when to use it to, to relax. And I think surrounding yourself with people that are positive, the people that you are climbing with or anywhere in life or whatever that area or structure may be, you can either choose people that are going to pull you down or hold you up and you have to be surrounded with people that are going to kind of give you that motivation and, and give you the try hard. And so I think that that was probably a big thing is just getting myself in a situation where I was with people that were going to support me from every level. Yeah, I, I, I concur with that a thousand percent. I think it's great. And, and some people, you know, this is individualized as well. Some people like people cheering for them and calling after them. Some people want it a pin drop at a crag, but climbing with people who know you or that you can at least communicate what your desires are when it's your turn to tie in is critically important. What about internally when you mentioned breathing, but is there and, and visualization? So breathing and visualization are tools there. And maybe you could expand on those for a minute. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the initial mindset has to be 
okay, you're okay with whatever outcome, like truly okay with whatever outcome happens. Because if you start really fixating on the outcome from the get go, then I think it's hard to be present. And so I think that's a big thing is just trying to get in a mindset where regardless of what happens, you're going to try as hard as you can, but you're fully aware that the outcome is going to go one way or another. And, and that truly doesn't matter. And it's more about the experience. I think if I can get into that mindset, those are when I'm going to perform the best. From a breathing standpoint, the breath is a really powerful tool. And CO2 is a really powerful molecule that helps with motivation, fear, anxiety. And so, you know, on the side, I do a lot of breath work and CO2 training to try to really prepare my mind and my brain for, you know, that pump and that feeling of uncomfortability um and so if you can really train your body to be okay in a very hypoxic state it's easier to stay in that flow you know i think some of the strongest and best endurance athletes it's not that they're not feeling the pump it's that they can maintain a level head they can maintain a level cardiac output in that certain state i mean as your co2 levels rise as the pump goes up you're still delivering oxygen to the tissues and you're actually going to extract it better if you can keep your breathing at a better rate. I mean, if you try to hyperventilate, you're going to drive out all that CO2. Your body's not going to be as efficient at oxygen exchange. So if you can stay in, you know, a nice, calm breathing mantra the entire time and really not be focused on the outcome, I think that's the best way mentally to stay present. So Thomas, let's talk about you now, um, things that you're psyched on, things that you're passionate about beyond that personal fight with gravity. And what is that for you? Sure. I think one big player is then research, specifically in the climbing field. I approached uh, my mentor during residency, who's now the research director at the University of Louisville Emergency Medicine Department. And he was able to partner with the chair there and get me on his grad as faculty in a research realm which is great. It gives me access to, you know, research articles. It gives me access to IRB, which allows us to do really, really proper studies. And so that's been a really cool thing over the last, you know, several months to try to get some ideas underway. And so we have a, a lot of ideas and projects right now in IRB approval and a lot of interest that's come out in the community with volunteers and that kind of thing to try to get some projects started. So that's exciting. Yeah, it seems like climbing specific research um, seems to be pretty much in its nascent stages still. I feel like a lot of the studies reference other sports and then kind of extrapolate them to climbing. So I'd, I'd love to hear what areas of focus you're looking to dive in, if, if you can tease some of that. Yeah, there there's definitely a, uh, a paucity of, of climbing literature out there. I think the last time I looked, something like in the last five years, there was 50 to 60 papers that were published with climbing as a specific topic. And so that, that's not very much at all. And most of those papers, they're really only looking at really specific things like, you know, finger pulley injuries is probably the number one research thing. And then besides that, it's more of the kind of like energy system metabolism type work. But climbing is just such a hard sport to take really good accurate measurements and so it's really a difficult thing to try to take that take the, the scientific literature from other sports and try to apply it to climbing and it just doesn't cross over very well so just to kind of give you a little bit of a taste we're going to be looking at vo2 max in beginner intermediate and advanced climbers we're going to be placing uh, continuous glucose monitors on climbers for a period of time looking at how the glucose data correlates with a metabolic cart. So looking at, you know, percentage of VO2 max and how that would correlate with a glucose level, both in a fasted and unfasted state. So that may give us a better idea about how we could use as climbers, a continuous glucose monitor in the training field, and then also in a performance way as well. And then the last piece that I'm really excited about is, is looking at uh, glycogen content and utilization in the forearm using ultrasound. There's, there's been really good research recently looking at cyclists and runners, soccer players, where they will do glycogen, approximate glycogen measurement using ultrasound in the lower extremity, but no one has looked at this in the upper extremity at all. And so climbing is really specific in that we don't do this really long, drawn out, maybe, you know, maybe like a big wall climber like Alex Honnold, but, you know, from a sport climbing or bouldering perspective, we're not really tapping into that system 
for a prolonged period of time. And so most of the studies show that that glycogen depletion happens somewhere around 60 to 90 minutes. And so we're well shy of that. So it'd be interesting to look at, you know, in a 20 minute sport climb or 15 minute sport climb, are we depleting the glycogen? How, how much is it being depleted? Is it still there? And so looking at that with CGM data, with VO2 max data, hopefully that'll give us a little bit of an insight on how we use, use glycogen from a climbing standpoint. Man, that's really exciting to hear. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful that, that folks like yourself are able to dive in and bring a, a real scientific method to this kind of thing, because ultimately I'll get to benefit from it. And fr from your seat, when you take a look at the sport of climbing compared to other sports out there, sports that have been around for longer or maybe have just been are, are better funded because they have, you know, really big yeah. TV contracts and these kinds of things. Where does climbing stack up with regard to the science of making training and performance uh, optimized? Yeah, I mean, I think as a sport, I mean, we're very humbled as far as the data that's out there. I mean, we're, we're definitely not a scientific sport yet. You, I think that if you look at things like running and cycling, those are probably at the top, at the forefront. I think number one, it's because it's so easy to measure. I mean, you can stick a treadmill or a stationary bike in pretty much any science lab and have the participants really measure that easily. There's only a few people that have really, really dove in and looked at climbing from a scientific perspective. And there's not really many around the world that are doing it. You know, I, I, I think that it's, it's a detrimental asset right now that we don't have that, but I think that it's exciting that we are at the beginning. I, we talked about just the published literature. That curve is, is just shooting up so much. So yes, it's still low, but if you look at where it was compared to say the 90s or even the early 2000s, virtually nobody was doing much at all. And now it, it's, it's exponentially growing, which is really exciting. So I think that very shortly, we're going to start to see kind of this training 2.0 kind of hit where we went from the you know climbing is training to now really people are in this training 1.0 where you see people doing max hangs and campus boarding and and just using a board in general and i think now we're going to start to bust into that kind of climbing 2.0 um, where people are using scientific literature and evidence-based literature to do their training that's exciting so let's play that thought experiment out just a little bit further flash forward a year five years, whatever you think kind of the time period is right, where, where training 2.0 has really kicked into gear. And take a look at maybe an average climber and maybe an elite climber. How much is being left on the table right now? How much for, for me, I'm trying to get to my first 13A. I'm, you know, kind of the weekend warrior average climber. You're obviously in the elite climber category. And then look at, you know, people at the tip of the spear. I don't know, the, the Will Boseys of the world or the Tommy Caldwells of the world or obviously Adam Andra, you know, take a look at them. And then also, again, maybe like kind of a weekend warrior. And as we as we get into training 2.0 in earnest, and we've maybe you've concluded some of these studies and not only taken those those conclusions, but also built some sort of practical way for us to then take advantage of the learnings that you've that you've gleaned from the research that you're doing. Do you have a sense for what like the percentage of opportunity that's there for us if we're able to implement some of these tools that may come of the, the research that you and some of your colleagues are doing? I mean, if we're asking like how much of an average climber's training is just chaff that can be, you know, cut off, you know, I think it's quite a bit. I mean, I don't think that I train with a considerable amount of hours at the gym. I mean, I bet I put in maybe eight hours of dedicated training a week, which I think in the grand scheme of things compared to maybe a recreational climber, they may go to the gym for three or four hours, several days a week, they, they may be dwarfing that. So I think, I think getting efficient and getting a little bit better dogma around our sport on what works and what doesn't work is probably the first thing that will come. I think one of the things that we don't have in the literature is really these parameters on what can be used by an average climber to be really efficient. And so if you look at things like a Peloton or a treadmill, or you talk to an average runner, they all know their heart rate zones. They all know this is what I'm going to do from a wattage standpoint today on the bike. And we have whole workout programs 
built into these bike and running systems. And it's all evidence-based because it's been studied time and time again, and we just don't have that in climbing. And so I would venture to guess that, you know, for a recreational climber, it may be that almost 50% of their time is wasted not getting better. Now, that that may be not wasted though, right? So, I mean, I think climbing is very unique and that it's very social. It has a community aspect to it that a lot of other sports don't. You know, you look at a lot of cyclists and they go on these, you know, long, slow distance coffee rides. And is that significantly helping their training? Probably not as much as they would, but they get that community aspect out of it. Sure. And so, you know, climbing as a sport almost has that religious feel where we have these kind of sanctuaries where everyone kind of gets together. They share in the same values and purpose. And I think that we have to be careful with, you know, our language on you know how much of it is 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 chap. I think that's definitely individualistic, but I would say. A beginner climber, maybe 50% of what they're doing is not getting them better. Maybe more of an intermediate advanced climber, maybe 15 to 20% may not be getting them better. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I think to your point, we all climb for different reasons. And sometimes we just purely climb for fun and we're not trying to push our upper end or optimize our training or just it's just a way to blow off steam after work or connect with the community. But a lot of the people who are going to be tuning in here uh, and as tends to be the kind of the, the, the trend curve, if you will, is the longer you're in the sport, it tends to be the more you start to prioritize gains and improvements and, and wanting to work up the grade ladder and these kinds of things. At least that was certainly the case with me and, and the group of climbers that I hang out with predominantly. Mm -hmm. And just this thought of maybe 15 to 20 percent is available to optimize is really cool. Uh, and to your point, it doesn't necessarily mean more time. And in fact, in conversations that I've had with Eric Hurst or Tom Randall and yourself and other athletes that I've, that I've uh, interviewed on this show, oftentimes you're spending less time. It's just more focused. It's more specific, right? right? I think that's a really good point as far as specificity. I think that Throughout the uh, training cycle, I think that it's always a good idea to go from, you know, less specific down to more specificity where you can really tailor that intensity to the right purpose. Oh, well, it's really exciting. Can't wait to see where this research leads and obviously how it will translate to myself and, and everybody else on, on how we train, how we perform, how we fuel uh, so to that end, how do we follow along with the work that you're doing and also just, you know, uh, all the other things that you're working on uh, just in your own uh, climbing goals? Yeah, definitely. I think that taking that research from the bench and taking it out into the community is definitely the next step. We talked about the training 2.0. I think that there's a lot of sports that are now kind of already in the training 3.0 where they're taking not only the training principles, but they're taking the whole body really and trying to make that as precise and as high end as they can. And so that's one thing that I'm excited about. We're gonna get ready to launch a website here this week where I'm gonna try to offer some, you know, functional medicine, concierge medicine type of feel where we can try to take athletes from the 2.0 to the 3.0. And what we would do with that would be things like blood work, genetic testing, stool studies, microbiome, CGM monitoring, you know, detailed training plans, and then working with those athletes really in all sports to try to take their performance up that extra degree. So if we talked about, you know, the initial training 2.0 may get you, uh, you know, a couple extra percent, 15, 20%, this may get us those extra little percentile points where people are trying to, you know, really, really strive to get their personal best. And I think it's really suits people that are in their 30s and 40s and beyond where they may have hit a plateau or they may have hit a point in their climbing where they're really searching for something. They feel like they're having their training dialed in. What else can we do? And I think that's where, you know, things like blood work, genetics, getting a physician consult can really help. And we can dive into their nutrition. We can dive into their supplement use. We can dive into their hormones and really try to optimize that for them. Man, that's exciting. Well, look, we'll put your website in the show notes of this podcast as well as on the Instagram page, and we'll link to your Instagram as well. So we'll be staying tuned with all that. I'm, I'm really psyched and, and, again, grateful for the work that you're going to be putting in for the community. Let's talk about your climbing for just a couple seconds here uh, to, yeah. to wrap up this conversation. 
uh, you, you just put down a very hard proj that you were working on for quite some time with Southern Smoke. We know that Southern Smoke Direct is the next one in the sites, and we're kind of pushing into the warmer months here uh, at the time of this recording. It's uh, mid-May 2023. So what is it, what's it going to look like kind of on a, on a general sense? How, how do you think Southern Smoke Direct is going to come together for you here? Yeah, I think I'm going to take a uh, a note out of the playbook from Will Bossy and Aiden Roberts. And, you know, I think setting a, a Mimic Boulder problem is really the next step. So talk to, to Cole over at Mimic Holds. Those guys do awesome 3D replicas, and they were gracious enough to go down to the Red River Gorge and scan the holds of that boulder and start making some holds. So those are going to be in the mail hopefully in the next week or two. So I'll construct kind of a little mimic on the Woody in the garage and, you know, try to mess and play with that. I think that's really going to give me the most time to, to see what happens. And that wraps up our chat with the highly qualified crusher, Dr. Thomas Cunningham. What did you all think of this one? Let us know. You can find us on IG at Thomas Cunningham MD and at The Struggle Climbing Show. Now, in a second, I'm going to hit you with my takeaways and also share how you can personally work with Thomas if you'd like, as well as how you can learn more about everything that we touched on today at zero cost. But first, let's support the brands that are supporting the struggle. Give it up for Fizzy Vantage, y'all, the official climbing nutrition sponsor of The Struggle. Guys, they just released two incredibly delicious new flavors of their supercharged collagen, lemon honey tea and pomegranate berry, both of them so good. And of course, will support your connective tissue as you train hard. Check it all out, along with everything else they make to help athletes perform at their best. In Europe, you can find it on the Epic TV and Banana Fingers online shops. And in the US, you can find it all at select gyms and, of course, at fizzyvantage.com. Hit that link in your show notes or use code STRUGGLE15 at checkout for 15% off. And a shout out to Crimped, spelled C-R-I-M-P-D, which is the most advanced and motivating training app that I have ever used. It's totally free. It has programs for bouldering and sport climbing, and it really takes the guesswork out of how to program your training. So if you're a self-coached athlete, or if you just like hit a plateau in your fitness, hit that link in the notes or pop over to crimped.com or just search crimped in your app store to download it for free. Oh man, so many takeaways here from this chat with the Send Doctor. And I think I just coined a new nickname for you, Thomas, the Send Doctor. Somebody send me a nickel every time anybody calls Thomas the Send Doctor. I digress. Honestly, as a uh, fellow dad with a full-time job and very limited time to train and climb, I'm just like off the charts motivated by what Thomas has been able to accomplish. I may not have the genetic potential that he has, and let's be honest, I absolutely do not have the genetic potential that he has, but he really serves as a great example of what can be done with a scientific look at all aspects of training and climbing and nutrition. Specifically, I'm really excited to utilize the tread wall as I train for my 13A project and to pay closer attention to how and when I fuel. If you would like to dive deeper into the science with Dr. Cunningham, you can connect through his website, which is thomascunninghammd.com, where for zero cost, you can sign up for his newsletter, you can read incredibly insightful blog posts that he's got up there, access research papers, it's all there, and you can also book a consult with the man himself if you would like to take things up a notch. I recommend you check out his site right now, it is packed with awesome beta. I am also super excited, y'all, to share that Thomas and I are collaborating on a series of YouTube videos that are going to be diving into specific topics. We're talking about caffeine, breath work, sleep, injury, proper warm up, supplementation, all of this and more. I'm so pumped. Head over to the channel, youtube.com slash at the struggle climbing show and subscribe to get all that great content when it hits, along with, of course, two fresh videos each week featuring the best climbers in the game. All right, that clips the anchors on this episode. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. I'm so damn grateful for all of y'all's support as I work my harness off over here in the podcast slash utility closet to bring you what I hope is like really valuable, high quality content to keep you psyched and informed as you hit that morning commute or your climbing warm up or just chip away at that pile of unfolded laundry that's been sitting next to your couch for the past nine days. Okay, I'm going to get to the laundry soon, darling. I promise you. 
Now, if you'd like to give back to the show in a little way, please consider coming aboard as a patron. For the price of a cheap beer each month, you're going to get exclusive access to early and ad-free episodes, pro clinics held by the world's top climbers, and other super cool perks. Plus, you will be supporting me as I jam away at all hours instead of folding laundry. I promise you, Kara, I'm about to come fold laundry. Please stop messaging me. All right, y'all, check it all out at patreon.com slash the struggle climbing show. Thank you. I love you. Hey, hey, did you know the struggle's carbon neutral in partnership with the Honol Foundation? They are doing amazing work, y'all, to bring clean energy to communities around the world. Check out their latest impact report, which is super inspiring. Swing over to honolfoundation.org. They're really doing it right, so toss them some love if you can. And lastly, The Struggle is a proud member of the Plug Tone Audio Collective, a diverse group of the best, most impactful podcasts in the outdoor industry. This show was produced and hosted by me, Ryan Devlin. Struggle makes us stronger. Let's climb hard and do good things in the world. <laughs>